All right, welcome guys. How you doing today? Do you like you like our new place? All right, awesome. Well, and it was so many people uh, helping last yesterday get it ready. So very excited uh, that we continue to meet. God has been blessing us. I'm glad you're here today. That you found the signage. That God found your way here. So that's a good thing. So you guys, I introduced you to my family a couple weeks ago, and I got uh, three children, Woody, uh, Gwendolyn, and Charlotte, and Woody is three years old, and he's a great kid, love him to death, but he's got this thing, and I didn't know this, it was different with the girls, but is it true, little boys have to pee, like, all the time? Like, constantly, constantly, like, I can't believe it, sometimes I think something's wrong with him, I'm like, uh, my wife, I'm like, hey, baby, we maybe need to take him to the doctor, because he goes so often, we'll go to a restaurant, he goes three or four times before we leave, I'm thinking, I didn't see him drink that much water, I don't even know what's going on here. So we were out at a restaurant just it was like about a month ago, and it was after church, and we're all there. It was at uh, Tony's Texas Barbecue, by the way. That place is amazing. If you've not been there, I really enjoy it. But we're there, and I'd already taken him like two or three times because, you know, I'm the dad. Usually I take him into the men's room. And if, you're, if you do take your boy in there, you know that you got to do a couple things because it's so unsanitary in the bathroom. So you got to find out, first off, what do you got to do, right? So we use the word chi-chi for number one, and we use popo for number two, okay? So I say to him all the time, is it chi-chi or popo? You know, most of the time it's chi-chi, which I'm grateful for, because if there's a low enough urinal, I can just stand him there, and I kind of stand behind him, I hold him so that he won't move and try to touch anything, right? Or I, but if he's number two, you got to wipe up the seat. Well, he'd already gone a couple times, and he goes, I got to go. I got to go to the bathroom. So I'm like, all right, let's go. And you know how kids are. I don't understand this, but they wait to the last minute. It's like there's no warning time. There's no, there's, it's like ground zero. Once he says it, he's got to go, and you're running to get there. So I'm running in there, and I'm like, is it Chi-Chi or Popo? And he's like, Popo. And I'm like, are you sure? Are you positive? Because, again, there's two things that are going to happen. There's going to be, if it's Chi-Chi, you're behind him. But if it's Popo, you've got to be in front of him. So I'm like cleaning the seat as best I can clean the seat. I'm getting him ready. And I'm like, are you sure? And I'm like, yes. And so just in case, I always say this. Sometimes he goes Popo without going Chi-Chi, which is amazing. But I say to him, I say to him, push it between your legs. And so I get his pants down. I pick him up. And I'm like, push it between your legs. And I'm like this. And he's not even on the seat. And it shoots out. Like he hadn't gone all day long and I'm in front of him. And that's why I asked him the question, is it Chi-Chi or Popo? Because I don't want to be in the firing range, right? I don't want to be in the firing zone. And there he is. And he starts hitting me and it's like shooting like a laser. And I'm like, Woody, push it between your legs. (laughs) And he's going and there's nothing I can do because I can't drop him, right? And I can't stop it and I can't push it between his legs. I finally get him down, but he's doused my whole leg. It's all over my ankles. And I'm just like, oh kid are you going popo no i'm like i thought you said it was popo he doused me so i just cleaned him up zipped him up walked out there and i just pretended like no one's gonna notice and sat down with chi chi all over my legs there's nothing i could do and i'm like ah but i felt so hopeless helpless in that moment right you guys ever feel like there's these moments where you're helpless you just can't There's nothing you can do. It's like, it's it. I'm going to get doused with pee. That's just the the end of it, you know? And we're in in situations like that every day where life is like out of our control. Like we just, we can't control it. I mean, just look at the world we live in right now. You know, you want to call it peaceful protests or rioting. We see the videos, right? We see buildings burning, people getting hurt, some people getting killed or dying, right? And we're just like, man, what's going on? Property being destroyed. and, And we're just thinking, I just think, when is someone going to step in and do something? I feel kind of helpless when I'm watching it and it's far away and I'm like, this shouldn't be happening. Or COVID-19, we're in the middle of it and it's deciding so many things. We're meeting here because we can't meet at our other one because of COVID-19. The great news is, if anything goes wrong in your life this year, just say COVID-19 and it's okay. Don't pay the government your taxes, COVID-19. That's all you got to do, right? And you should be fine. So at least we got to pass. But look at Hurricane Laura just went by. We couldn't stop it. Couldn't do a thing. We're all we're doing is praying for people. There's someone in our church who lives in Houston, and I'm like, I was on the, I was texting her back and forth, and she's like, you know, pray for us because I don't know if it's going to hit us. You know, these kind of things make us feel a little bit helpless. They make they make us feel like we don't have control. But really, we don't even have to venture that far out of our own lives to really understand that 
We don't have always that much control. I mean, if you've got a teenager right now and you try to tell them something, do they listen to you? <laughs> like, you tell them things and then they're like, you know that you have a little bit more wisdom from the, by, uh, than they do, but they don't recognize that. <laughs> they think you don't know anything. Don't worry, in about six or seven years, you're going to be smart again. I, just the way it works, okay? But what about even with your spouses, right? You're hoping you're going to be on the same page about something, and then you realize you're not. I thought we discussed this. You're like, man, I just thought this was going to work out this way. What about your job, downsizing or, or, or being transferred, right? How come is it they never consult us about those things? You're just the victim. They're like, they tell you what's going to happen. Or maybe the market has done something, you know, done a number on your 401k right now, and you're like, what can I do? I'm just, it's, I just, I'm subject to whatever is happening right now. And it feels sometimes like we don't have any control, like no power to do anything. And it, it makes us wonder at times, what power does any one of us really have to make a difference? I mean, think about that for a moment. What are we supposed to do when moments like this make us feel helpless? Well, none of us wants to believe that we can't make a difference in the world. You know, because it's hope. Think about this. Hope is the thing that keeps all of us going. That hope somehow we are going to be, things are going to turn out the way we want them to. But what do we do when we don't think we have the power to change things? Power to change our marriages. Power to change our families. Power to make a difference in our workplace or in our world or in our church. Well, we're in a series right now, Courageous. Find the strength to do the impossible. And we've been reading the book of Esther. So if you're just joining us for the first time, we've been into it a couple weeks now. And it takes place 500 years before Jesus even walked the earth, okay? So back it up a little bit. And then there's these people, the Jewish people, they've actually been taken captive and they were brought to a foreign land. And they were dispersed throughout this kingdom and they've been there for 100 years. And there's about 15 million Jews, they estimate, that were dispersed throughout the kingdom, but not in their own homeland. And now if that wasn't bad enough, for 100 years they're displaced, all of a sudden their whole nation is now in jeopardy. Their people, their culture is on the verge of annihilation. Because if you were here with us last week, we were in chapter 3, and we found out that this man who was second to, in power to the king gets mad at the people of the Jewish people, and he wants to annihilate them. He wants to get rid of them all. And on a certain date, they decide that everyone in, throughout the kingdom, if you had a neighbor who was Jewish, that you could attack them, kill them, and take all their possessions. And it's like, this day is coming, and it's going to happen. And they already set the date. It's a couple months away. And they're all thinking, what are we going to do? They must have felt helpless. And there are just two people, Mordecai and Esther. And they're Jews. And Esther became queen because she won a beauty pageant. And now she's the queen. Next to Artaxerxes, or Xerxes the king, also Ahasuerus his name. But here she is, but she hasn't told him she's a Jew. So she's got this secret, and she's like there, right there near him. Not even the king knows this. And then her uncle Mordecai decides to stand up for being a Jew and not bow down to the second in command. His name was Haman. And because of his action, this guy gets mad and wants to wipe them all out. And I mean, all they think, what are they thinking? The two of them, like, man, we're in this position. We're the closest to the king, but we feel helpless. What are we supposed to do? Well, I think we're going to learn some stuff from their story today. So we're going to pick it up in Esther chapter 4, and it starts here. It's going to be up on your screen. It's also in your outline. It says, when Mordecai learned uh, all, that the, had, all that had happened, he tore his clothes, and he put on sackcloth and ashes, and he went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry, and he went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate. So he was out in the city, he's walking around, and we know from last week he actually sat in the king's gate, but he couldn't enter there because the king didn't want any sorrow or revolting or anything, so he could only go to a certain point. And so the king's gate uh, clothed with the sackcloth, and then and in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, <clears throat> and the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai and to take his sackcloth away from him. So from her window, wherever she is, she's kind of tucked away in a special room where no one really could get to her. So maybe she hadn't heard about this, but she sees Mordecai out there and she wants to help him out. So she sends him some garments from the castle and uh, to take them away from him, but he would not accept them. And then East Esther called uh, Hath Hath Ach uh, one of the king's eunuchs whom he had appointed to attend to her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hathach 
went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. So he also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that's the capital where they live, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and that he might command her to go to the king and make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hathach returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. So there they are. He's, he's mourning. And, and sackcloth and ashes and fa- fasting. Fasting, if you're not familiar, simply means you deprive yourself of food and water for a period of time for a special purpose. And usually it was a spiritual purpose to draw yourself closer to God. But also what's happening here is sackcloth. Sackcloth was not like the burlap sackcloth that we see potatoes come in. It was actually... It was actually goat skin, usually goat skin, because it was very coarse hair, and they would turn it inside out. So the soft leather part wasn't touching you, but actually the goat skin rubbing against your skin. And then they would take ashes and pour them over their heads. Can you imagine if you went to the beach and your kids threw sand at you like mine throw it at me, and it gets in your suit, and it gets up in your hair, and then you decide not to shower, right? You're going to be scratching your hair, going to bed. You know, it's going to be so itchy and irritating. And that was the point. They wore the sackcloth and the ashes to be irritated and kind of disturb their bodies. I mean, this guy is serious. Think about it. This is a serious issue. I mean, if anyone was around here to come and do that, you'd be going, okay, there's something going on in your life, right? So he gets serious, and so do some of the people. So Esther starts out, though, trying to solve Mordecai's problem with a very easy solution. (laughs) Oh, there's a problem here. He looks like a homeless man. Something's going on. Let's just do this. Let's just make him comfortable. We'll give him some clothes, and we'll make him comfortable. And so she just goes for the easy fix. And I'm pretty sure she probably knew there was something deeper going on here, but she decides to treat the symptom and not the problem. Now, I, as you know, or you may know, I was on staff at a church for 19 years. And during that 19 years, I did a lot of counseling. That was kind of my job was the counseling and well, along with some others, but I would get these phone calls with the craziest stories. And over the years, I will share them with you because nobody knows these people anyway. So this guy calls on the phone And he says, listen, I want some marital counseling. And I said, okay, no problem. I'll send you the form. And he goes, yeah, but listen, how old is your pastor? And I said, well, he's fairly young. You know, he's in his 30s or whatever, his 30s. And he's like, okay. And he goes, well, because my pastor's really young and he really wouldn't understand. So that's why I'm not doing it there. And that's really code for he doesn't want to reveal this to his own church because they'll go to a different church sometimes for counseling. And that's fine. So he said, listen, I go, well, he's going to be younger, but we can still do it. He goes, okay, okay. So I'm like, what's the nature of your problem? Well, I'm having trouble with my marriage and with my wife. And she's just like on me all the time. And she's like nagging. And I just, we don't get along very well. And she yells at me. And I'm like, okay, well, why don't you fill out the thing? And she's like, something else I have to tell you. And I'm like, what is it? He goes, well, I've had an affair on my wife. But I don't want to include that in the counseling. I'm like, Okay. Like, you realize you can't solve your issue if you don't get to the root of your problem, and this needs to be shared. Yeah, but if she finds this out, it's only going to get worse. And I'm like, well, that's the point of counseling, so you can work it out. He never came for counseling, okay? And I never saw the man. But he was trying to fix the, the, the symptom. Like, I just want her to stop doing this. But he didn't want to deal with the issues that were, at, were a problem. Look, you can't come to counseling and hide something as big as that and expect that you're going to fix your marriage, Right? And I told him, listen, sir, you're going to have to reveal this at one point if you really want to fix this situation. You see, that's what most of us do sometimes. We try to treat the symptom and ignore the root of the problem. You see, it's easier to treat the symptom, isn't it? Because it doesn't really require much from us. We can just kind of change the outside, fix it up a little bit, and then we're good. But if you really want to get to the root of the issue, that requires change. There is a little bit more difficult. And so a lot of times we avoid that. You see, and that's what the religious leaders of Jesus' time were trying to do when it came to sin. We'll just kind of, kind of make it look good. We'll make the outside look good. And then that way, uh, it, it'll appear right. But inside, there was still a problem. You see, listen to what Jesus said to them when they were trying to do this. He says, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. Indulgence. Blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. You can clean the outside of the cup all day long. It's not going to make the cup worthy of being having a drink out of, right? Someone hands you a cup and you look inside and it's all gross inside, you're still not going to drink from it. And that was the problem. They're like, we're going to clean the outside, but you're not dealing with the issue. 
You're not getting serious about what the problem is. And you see, you're not going to change anything if you just change the surface. But at one point, we've all kind of tried to do that at some time in our life. And maybe you're doing it in some area of your life right now, right? We think, well, if we, we just change our looks, that's going to change everything, right? If I just look younger and I try this thing, or maybe we, like, we change our job. If we just change the bo- a different boss, then that's going to solve all my problems. I know it. If I just get a different boss, because it's the boss, that's the issue. Or maybe we're like, we're just going to change and move to a new city and start new, fresh. And when I start fresh, everything's going to be different than it was before. Or we're like, oh, you know what? If I just get a different spouse, if I just, right, let's just get rid of the old one, right? And then I get a new one, they're going to understand all my problems, and then it's all going to get solved. You know, it's not going to make a difference if you're not willing to do the hard work of changing yourself. Because wherever you go, there you are, right? It's us sometimes that is the common denominator in those situations, so Mordecai, though, is not going to let her get away with this easy fix because it's not going to solve the real issue. So he's like, hey, I'm not going to take these clothes. Go back, tell her what's really going on because we got to deal with the issue and not just solve this little problem. So it might solve the problem that Mordecai had, or Esther has with Mordecai, but it's not going to save the lives of the Jews if you give me clothes, right? Think about that. We can cover that over, but it's never going to save them. So Mordecai goes back to his fasting. Now, fasting is an interesting thing, and for me, it's always been kind of a mystery, especially when I was younger. I don't think I've ever ever fasted when I was young. I've been fasting a lot lately, um, especially, but we don't really know a whole lot about it. I mean, it's kind of a mysterious thing. All we're told is if you do it, maybe something will happen. So we see like people in the Bible fasting. We see Jesus fasting for a spiritual purpose, and it's kind of a statement that there's more to life than just the physical. So we deny ourselves something so that we can then become a little bit closer to God. We're basically saying, God, I want you more than food right now. I want this answer more than I want food and comfort. And that's what these people were doing. The Jews were saying, look it, we need you more than I need this right now in my life. And think about this, we need food, right? You can't go probably six hours without your stomach telling you how hungry you are. But it's not a way, fasting is not a way to earn grace from God. You don't fast and go, oh, God, look at me. I'm working so hard and so diligently. And God looks at you and has pity on you. That's not the purpose of fasting. Because it's really, fasting is about our hearts. When Joel the prophet is talking to the Jewish people who are in this situation, he says this. Go ahead. It's going to come up on the screen right now. Here we go. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. See, the purpose was to turn to God with your heart. Not that God would like say, oh, you're earning somehow this thing. Fasting is not about being more spiritual. I can tell you I fast all day and you can go, oh, John, you're so spiritual. It's not about being spiritual. It's about being in tune with the spirit. You see, we deny the flesh so we can come closer and understanding God more. And see, that's what these people are doing. And is there something in your life right now that needs serious attention? There were some, there were some strongholds in my life at different times, whether it's your attitude Maybe it's sinful habits that you're in, or maybe it's a situation that you're, you're like seeking more guidance from God on. Maybe you should try fasting. Before we planted the church, I fasted once a month for two years straight. No, twice a month, actually. And, and, and it was because I, needed, I wanted to hear from God. And I'm not trying to say that to brag in any sense of the word, but you know what? God did amazing things through that fasting in my life. Not because I deserved it, but because God just works in that way. Fasting is one of the spiritual tools that God has given us that works in the spiritual realm. Like prayer and reading our Bible, we're not always sure how it works, but it works. And God says these things, so when we do fast, we are going to see change in your life. And maybe today, you need a spiritual breakthrough. Maybe today, you're looking for an answer or you're looking for some kind of uh, revelation in your life. Then I would suggest that you try fasting, because sometimes that's what we need. And because it makes a serious, <clears throat> uh, because it takes a serious response, you'll see serious change in your life. But whatever you're going through, the easy solution is never the answer. It will never be the answer for you. Esther starts out with the easiest solution, and she's gonna, and she's hoping it will all go away. I'm just gonna give you clothes, and we're hoping this is gonna change the situation. But it's gonna, it's, it's gonna take a lot more than that for her. And so God invites us, you and me, into the journey. And the reason he does that is because we'll never appreciate the magnitude of God's victory without feeling the depth of our problems. See, sometimes we have to come face to face with the problem to understand when God really comes through. I mean, think about this for a moment. The Red Sea crossing would look a whole lot different if Pharaoh's army wasn't chasing behind him, wouldn't it? 
Like, when you're surrounded by a mountain on either side, the Dead Sea in front of you, and the army coming to kill you, suddenly that Red Sea parting makes a lot more difference, and God's deliverance is a lot much grander than we had thought. And so when you're in those moments, then you'll appreciate God even more. But let's continue with the story. So then Esther spoke to Hathach and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, <clears throat> put all to death, except for the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these last 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words, and Mordecai told them to, uh, to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So she can't even go into the presence of the king if he doesn't like put his scepter toward her or she's going to die. And the, 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 the book of Esther is such a dramatic book, isn't it, when you read it? I mean, this woman who's like a little poor orphan Juro's girl becomes queen. It's like, whoa, this is really awesome. And then this guy gets rises to power and he wants to wipe out all the Jews. I mean, how, how often has that ever happened in our nation's history that they want to wipe out a people? And so this evil man wants to do that, annihilate them. They're on the verge of extinction. And it comes down to this that she has to plead for her people. Like, it seems like this is the only hope. If you go in there and talk to the king, even though Mordecai says God's power is great enough that he can do something from somewhere else, but, like, this is up to you. Maybe you've been placed in this position for such a time as this. Now, not all of our stories have to be this dramatic. I mean, some of you guys have incredible stories, and I've heard some of you talk about them. And some of us say, well, man, it's not that dramatic. It's not that big a deal. Like, God's been works in my life. But God has a purpose in your story, no matter what you're doing. You've been placed in your life for such a time as this. No matter what your situation is, no matter what your home life is like, no matter what your work life like, is like or anything like that, God has put you there for this, such a time as this. You see, consistency every day in your walk will lead to great achievements over time. Listen to the process of growth as Paul explains it to us, spiritual growth. Here, it's on the screen. Here we go. No. Uh, oh, I, did I? No, not yet. I did. You don't have to do great things to have a great impact. Did I say that? Sorry. Pull out your outlines <laughs> for a moment. The first thing is you don't have to do great things to have a great impact. So let's go to the verse, though, quickly. Keep going. For this re very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. So you start with a little bit of faith. He says, add goodness. And to the goodness, add knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, mutual affection. And to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying keep moving forward in your walk. And as you build slowly, consistently, eventually over time, you'll have the opportunity to do great things. You see, it may start small, but consistency, consistency will create a change in your life. When we were young, there was this feeling that someone else will do it. My kids come up to me constantly. Poppy, can you buy me this? Poppy, can you get my water bottle? Poppy, can you help me go to the bathroom, right? <laughs> but over time, those things begin to change. But it also has to change in us. If we're still expecting someone else to do it, then we're never going to take that responsibility, responsibility on in our own lives. And there's a point in our life where we have to start doing our own things. We have to go to our jobs ourselves. We have to make sure our own taxes are paid. We have to make sure we're going to bed consistently on our own without someone telling us to do those things. There's this time comes when you'll stop looking for someone else to do it and that you will start to do it. What happens in your home you're, is, you're, is the example that you set in your life. You see, how you behave in your house is going to now be the responsibility that you set for your kids. You know, you can't tell somebody not to smoke, but you smoke, right? Smoking's not good for you, don't smoke, but then you smoke six packs a day. What do you think they're going to do? 
I don't know if you smoke six packs a day, even one cigarette. But if you ask them not to, you can't do it. Do as, do as I say and not as I do has never been a good strategy, and I don't think it's going to change with you and me, right? So if we want our kids and our children and our family and our wives and our husbands to be more like God, then we have to demonstrate that ourselves. We have to live out our faith. And maybe right now, you're in your place, your workplace, your job, your house for such a time as this so that you can influence them through the consistency of your own walk. Do you guys know who Tony Evans is? This is a picture of him right here. He's a preacher um, in, da- in Dallas. And he's a huge ministry, thousands of people right now. And uh, this guy is an amazing guy, but you would think because of his effect that he has on people that he was always a Christian. But he grew up in a, in a, in a bad neighborhood in Baltimore, Maryland, and his parents weren't saved. In fact, they used to fight like crazy. They were on a verge of divorce. He, as he puts it, they used to fight by punching each other and even use knives sometimes. This is how bad it was in his home. And one day his father leaves to go to work and he's on the public bus and a man comes up to him, starts talking to him about Jesus and asks him if he's ever been saved before, if he understood it. He tells him the gospel and he receives the gospel right there on the bus. He comes home that day and, he, and as he describes it, Tony Evans describes it, that his life was clearly changed, his dad's life. But his wife was not convinced, and she was making his life miserable. In fact, he couldn't read the Bible in front of her, and she would just make fun of him, so he would get up at 2 in the morning to read the Bible and pray. And he did this for over a year. A year later, he's down at 2 in the morning, he's reading his Bible, he hears someone stir, he hears those footsteps coming down the stairs, and he's thinking to himself, oh my God, this is going to be another battle. And as he braces himself and he prays, she walks in there and she's crying. And he says to you, why are you crying? And she says this, every time I hate you, you love me. Every time I reject you, you accept me. Every time I turn away from you, you pray for me. I thought what you were doing was just a religious fad and it was going to fade away. But whatever it is you have, I want. And she broke down in front of him and he prayed and she received Jesus. And that changed the course of this man's life. Their son, their whole family came to know Jesus And it was transformed because one man said, I'm just going to be consistent and I'm going to do what I've been called to do. I've been called to this place in my place and we've all been called to the place that God has put us so that we can transform other people's lives. For you and I, every moment, every situation, every environment is a place for such a time as this. That's where we've been placed. And we don't need to be looking for the next great thing to do. It's right in front of us. If the consistency of your walk with God will set you up for the victories in life, if you continue to be consistent. So your position is a divine provision from from God. See, Mordecai is saying to Esther, listen, you're here for a reason. And God is saying that to you and I. Well, the rest of the chapter is right here. So then Esther says this. She told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are present in Sushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for the three days, night or day, my maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. So she gets ready, and so the second point is this, if you're in your outline, it's through surrender that you'll find victory. Did I miss the third, second point too? Man, I'm missing all the points. I missed the first one. If you, want to, if you want to see change, you have to get serious. Sorry, guys. But if you, it's through surrender that you'll find victory. See, Esther is reluctant. You see the exchange between her, Mordecai and Esther, and she's just like, you know, I'm not going to go before him. You see, you couldn't go before the king, not the Persian king. Because it was kind of like being a cupbearer. You know, the cupbearer tasted everything to make sure he wasn't going to die. Well, if you came into the courtroom unannounced, we didn't know who you were. We didn't know if you were accepted by the king. You could be there to kill him. So they had this rule. You can't even come in. And if he doesn't go throw his scepter pointing at you, like you can come in, then they killed you right on the spot. So he's like, if I show up and he doesn't say okay, this is going to be a problem. So she's scared. And, and on top of that, she's like thinking, man, I, there's, there's also another problem because he hasn't called me into his presence in like 30 days. 
I'm his wife. I haven't seen him in 30 days. Maybe I've kind of fallen out of favor with him. And maybe he doesn't like, like me anymore. If I show up, he's just going to be like, okay, that's it. I mean, the last queen, she didn't show up when he did call. And it was like, right, you're out of here. So she's thinking, if I show up when he doesn't want me to, what's going to happen? You know, so Esther realizes she could die. Now, whether she succeeds or doesn't is almost irrelevant to the decision she's about to make, is the truth of the matter. Because for all she knows is if I go in there, whether I succeed or not, I'm putting my life on the line. I have to walk in there being prepared that I am going to die. So her first response to Mordecai is, look, I can't. I can't go in there. But as she has time to think about this and pray about it, it turns to I will. I want you to notice something. There's something different between I can and I will. She doesn't sit there going, if I walk in that door, it's going to happen. I can do this. No, she says, you know what? Regardless of what happens, I will do it. I will walk in there. You know, it's in the decision that she becomes useful to God. It's in that moment that she becomes a useful vessel that God can use to do his best work. And it's in the same thing for you and me. It's in dying to ourselves that God is then able to use you as a vessel to change the lives of other people. Oftentimes, we want to do something when we know we can do it. We don't, want to, we, we don't surrender often because we think we can somehow do it ourselves. I can change my wife. I can change my marriage. I can change my kids. I can get them all in order. So we think we're going to do it ourselves. And that's when we bump in to the fact that we come to the end of ourselves. You see, it's only when we die to ourselves that God then can come in, transform us, work through us, and change our situations, to change our circumstances, to change our marriages, to change our lives to the, era, the way we want to. The path to new life is not knowing that you're going to succeed. It's in simply saying, God, I will surrender to you. I love what Paul says as he, as he writes this to the Romans. He, he says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable that is truly the way to worship him. A living sacrifice. you got to give up your life to be a living sacrifice. They say the problem with a living sacrifice, though, is it keeps crawling off the altar. And we have to remind ourselves every day to get back on that altar. And there's a, another translation, same verse, but I put it up here on the screen. Just go ahead. Uh, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, and you're sleeping and eating and going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Say, when you do that, when you surrender and you do that with your life, then I can come in here and I can make the changes that you need, so desperately need. You see, we have to be willing to die in order to, be, to experience real life in Christ. Whatever it is, whatever your situation is right now, it's easy to say to yourself, look at God, I can, I'm going to make sure this happens. Or I'm going to make sure that happens. We want to barge down the door and we're gonna say, we're going to do it no matter what. We're, and too bad if they don't want to do what we want. And every time we take that path, we open ourselves up to failure. But we say, you know what, God, I'm just going to surrender and I'm going to give it to you. That's when God can work in our lives. And that's when God can do the work. Esther's living this exclusive life. I mean, she's tucked away. She's got all that she wants. I mean, she asked for it and she's got it. If she wants manicures, if she wants massages, if she wants food, if she wants anything, Great clothing, jewelry, you name it. Whatever she wants, she has. She's in this place where she can have everything. She has everything to live for. But it can't save her. Right? Here she is in this place, but it's not going to save her when everything comes down. Only her surrender is the thing that can save her. Whatever you're going through right now, only your surrender is going to save you. When you give it to God, and you get serious. Listen, I need to get serious, God. Maybe it is fasting. Maybe it's prayer. I don't know what it is. But if you want a change in your life, and there's an area you say, like, this has to end. This has got to change. Or something inside of me. And I've been there many times on my knees going, God, I don't understand why I keep doing these things. It's because of our sinful nature. And you get on your knees, and you surrender to God. It's then that God can change you. It's then that God's going to change your situation around. And it's then that you're going to experience the victory. It's only through your surrender can you actually be saved. And when you give it to God, it's when God's going to do his best work in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your great goodness. 
Lord, it's such a strange thing because you've given us our skills, our abilities, you've given us our will, and, and sometimes we think we are going to win through those things. But God, may we understand <clears throat> that it's through our surrender is when we win. It was through the surrender of Jesus Christ on the cross that you won, that you defeated Satan, that you overcame sin. It was through surrender, even you, Lord. And so, Lord, let us yield ourselves to you, just as the, the verse in Romans said, our everyday life to you, God, that you might do a work in us and that we might experience your glory and the victory in the area we need it. Let's remain in an attitude of prayer for just a moment, but if you've never made a, ask Jesus into your heart, then I want to give you that opportunity. And you might say, well, why would I even want to do that? Because like I said, the reason why we do all these things, the reason why we resist and think that we can do it on our own is a sinful nature inside of us, our human nature, and we make mistakes. And when we've made those mistakes, it separated us from a holy and perfect God. But God didn't create you to be separated from him. In fact, he created you because he loves you and wants to be with you. And so what he did is he said, I'm going to take away that problem. But it wasn't easy. He went to the root of the problem and he actually died in your place. That's what Jesus did. He died for your sins and took all of that upon himself. It wasn't easy, but that's how much he loved you. That's how serious he was about you. He gave you what was most precious to him so that he could gain you and your heart because you're precious to him too. And so what we do is when we invite Jesus into our heart and accept his forgiveness... He gives us the righteousness of Jesus and that makes us acceptable in God's eyes. And if that's you today and you want to remove the barriers between you and God, I'm going to invite you to say this prayer with me. And I'm just going to invite everybody to say it out loud right with me now. Lord God, I open my heart. I invite you inside to be my God, my Savior, and my friend. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. I've decided today to follow you, Jesus, from this day forever. I'm yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, if you prayed that today, I just want to congratulate you. Welcome to the family of God.